safeguarding partnerships webinar on neglect. Neglect is a massive issue and concern for children pre-birth right the way through to adults at the end of life. And to discuss neglect, particularly how we identify neglect, assess neglect and intervene with neglect, I'm delighted to be joined by three colleagues from the Suffolk professional community, Amanda, Simon and Jennifer, representing social care, the police and health, but speaking as individual professionals as well in their own right. So I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves before we get going. Amanda. Right. My name is Amanda Takabarasha. I'm currently employed as um, a team manager for a social work team in Town, And my previous experience was as a safeguarding manager in the safeguarding team. And I also had a specialism in the self neglect and warding protocol um, in Suffolk and was heavily involved in the production of that. Thank you, Simon. Morning, uh, I'm Simon Bridgeland. I'm a detective inspector um, and I work for uh, Suffolk Police in um, Safeguarding, one of the three houses across uh, Suffolk. I'm based at Lowestoft at the Beaches. Um, been here a few years now and we deal with all manner of neglect really from um, the unborn child all the way through to perhaps the elderly vulnerable um, adult. So uh, the whole broad spectrum really of, of covering all aspects of neglect. Thank you, Simon. Jennifer. Hi, I'm Jennifer Blackburn. I'm named nurse for safeguarding children in North Suffolk. And I've also worked in the Lowestoft area and the Wadeney area, and I've had um, years of experience in health visiting and in various roles, um, working with families um, in, in cases of neglect and um, yeah, various vulnerabilities. Thanks, Jennifer. A few introductory remarks from me. Then I'm going to ask Amanda Simon and Jennifer in that order about their day to day work in this, particularly the detail and perhaps with some cases, because that always brings the issue um, into the foreground. So neglect goes right the way through from pre birth, where the placenta is not looked after properly, right the way through childhood, young adulthood, adulthood and old age towards the end of life. So the goal of successful neglect interventions and strategies is to minimise neglect pre-birth right the way through to the end of life. Knowing how pernicious it can be if your basic needs are not being met. Neglect shouldn't be conflated with poverty, although poverty can, of course, cause neglect through malnutrition, not eating and so on. But it's not an automatic correlation. Neglect is a separate form of child protection and child abuse. And Amanda's going to say a little bit how it's a separate category for adults with self-neglect and hoarding. What's really important is to understand the lived experience, the daily experience for the person potentially at risk of neglect. We can never say it never has any impact, but its impact is differential. We need to understand that in order to know how to intervene and whether to intervene legally on some basis. So that continuum is why we have colleagues from the main statutory agencies covering all ages, because we're an all ages partnership. And even though some of the categorization is separate, um, we want to bring out the themes in common as well. So over to Amanda. Yeah, thank you, Anthony. So. Um... I suppose my specialism is around self-neglect and hoarding, but like you say, um, neglect does cover that too. Um, and with trying to work with people over the last few months, um, what we've realised is that um, with the lockdown, we've found that to some degree, we haven't been able to see all the people we would normally want to see due to trying to protect them and protect ourselves. Um, so we haven't been able to pick up on the things that we normally would. So, for example, day centres are closed at the moment. Um, so where you might be able to identify maybe weight loss or um, somebody may not look as though they are being looked after properly, maybe by a care, carer or um, a family member, or perhaps they live alone and they appear not to be looking after themselves. So those are some of the difficulties we've found. Um, so 
we are finding that um, people are starting to come through a bit more now. So we are getting more calls where, um, you know, people are be becoming more and more in contact with services as they go out and about again. Um, and the legal element that you spoke about um, from a self neglect point of view, there was quite a big debate on whether or not self neglect should be included at all as an abuse category, um, which thankfully it was because um, people do experience significant harm from self neglect and hoarding. Um, and it is now an abuse category under Section 42 of the Care Act. So that's how I became involved in um, working with, um, you know, within the self neglect and hoarding. Um, and also with trying to produce some guidance for stuff, which hopefully we'll touch on later as well. Yes, yeah, thanks, Amanda. I'll come back to you about successful interventions in your experience. Um, I'm now pass to Simon. Yeah, um, kind of following on from um, what Amanda said um, there, Anthony, um, it's been quite difficult during lockdown to engage um, with uh, particularly elderly vulnerable people uh, vulnerable, vulnerable adults um, who may be either in um, daycare centres or in care homes at the moment who are shielding. Um, and we've seen, um, as we ease out of lockdown now, some of those referrals coming through which are uh, allowing us to go back. But again, picking up on, on an earlier point, we deal with in the police um, all forms of neglect from um, unborn child all the way through to um, adult and and our referrals predominantly will come um via the mash process so uh, referrals will go into the mash and be graded uh, uh, whether or not there's a joint visit needed under section 47 or section 42 of the care act and in the cases of children and young people will go out with social care uh, and conduct that joint visit um uh, and likewise under section 42 um for for adult and i think the the, the biggest point for me um in both cases of children and adults is uh, the importance of working together, making sure that we do work together with social care, either with CYP um, or in the cases of, of, of the adult team as well, um, and making sure we do exchange that information very early on um, to enable us to make the best decisions around, um, particularly in the cases of child safeguarding. Um, and I think that's the most important um, part for me as we work together uh, with with CYP as we move towards more sort of adult based investigations. I think, again, it's important to try and listen to the adults voice and um, to empower them to try and make that change. And certainly in my experience of cases of hoarding, um, now that that has become more of a recognised issue, there's far more support out there. And as Amanda has alluded to, again, I think it's really important that we go in and work together and try and empower that person to make those changes, particularly around hoarding and let them feel like they are leading that change. Um, as we know, we're dealing with children. If you tell a child to, to, to stop doing something, um, it's difficult to get them to understand. Um, so I think they're the strides that and the improvements that have been made over the last um, sort of certainly the last 12 months or so in my experience with um, adult cases of neglect. Um, thanks very much, Simon. And you raised a crucial point about the child's voice and the adult's voice being heard, especially if they're hidden in plain sight, because, of course, their voice is not always vocal. No. Um, they might be being silent. They might not want to say or they might be unable to say, so you have to use your professional antennae to to speak for them. Absolutely. Jennifer, for health visitors and school nurses, what um, what is their day to day experience of distinguishing between poverty and neglect where significant harm might be a risk? So, yeah, that's really crucial to consider the difference between poverty and neglect because um, poverty doesn't always indicate that there's going to be neglect in, in families and one of the things that um, our services has to think about is is the child at significant risk of harm from what their day-to-day -day lived experience is um, so we, we try to work really closely early, the earliest we possibly can with families so we will work with families in pregnancy alongside the midwives and some of the things we're looking at are is the mother accessing antenatal care 
is she ensuring that she has a healthy and nutritious diet for her herself and her unborn? Um, is she dependent on any, on any drugs or alcohol, or is there domestic violence or other mental health issues which is causing immense stress within the home, which would indicate that that unborn baby is at risk of actually having its health needs um, not being met? Working um, then as children get older, as we do home visits, it's quite easy to see I'm not saying no it's not easy to see at all actually it, as as you develop your skills of, of a professional you can walk into a home and see okay the family might not have a huge amount of financial resources but actually there are toys available for the children the children are appropriately clothed they might not have branded clothes but that doesn't matter they've got clothes which are suitable for um, the weather and suitable for their age um, and they've got access to to healthy nutritious food it might again it might not be the most expensive and you know these families might not be able to afford the most expensive food but they have fruit and vegetables and access to healthy and nutritious foods that are their health needs being met are they going to appointments to regular checks with their for their development or their immunizations with the gp are they taken to the gp when they're unwell so those are the things which actually we are trained to look out for which would indicate um, if there's neglect going on in the home. Um, and home visiting is, is gives a really, it's a real privilege to be able to go into somebody's home and to be, actually we're invited into the home, you know, we, we go in. Um, yes, you have to have consent. We have to have consent um, and it's about partnership working, as Simon was saying, with the, um, with the family, because, you know, you don't walk into someone's house and say, you should be doing this, you should be doing that. That doesn't work. For, for... One practitioner I spoke to said, well, well, one said, I always look in the fridge to make sure it's got food rather than alcohol. Yeah. Um, and another said, I always check whether the child's got a toothbrush. So yeah. without oversimplifying what you look out for, what what's the main trigger in your experience for serious neglect? Okay, so... What would you be most worried about? So we don't we don't look in unless we're doing a piece of work like the graded care profile with the family, which is where we would use that tool and we would be looking in fridges and things like that. Um, as we go into a home to say do a developmental review, that wouldn't be um, our responsibility or our role to look in the in the fridge. Um, and that's more social care's role. But what we the things which would really indicate uh, concerns are sometimes we walk in and the children are not really dressed at all quite often they're just running around in a vest it can be quite cold in the house there can be um very sparse furnishings um very grubby um furnishings that the sofas might be slightly um damp to sit on um quite often see lots of broken toys or no toys at all i've walked into houses where there has li literally been nothing for a child to entertain themselves with at all um, there, if the if the children are clamouring for your attention, quite often children who are emotionally neglected will come and sit on a professional they've never met before, climb on your lap, try and look in your bag, um, try and hug and kiss you. That's an indicator that a child is not having his emotional needs or her, her emotional needs met. Um, quite in the way that we would expect because a child would normally not do that so it's about looking at the general home environment as you're going into the house um, we also look where babies are sleeping so we would be expecting to see appropriate bedding and appropriate mattresses and the safe space for children to sleep um, um, okay yeah yep that's great thanks um maybe i'll just ask amanda and simon for a couple of key points when you assess or investigate. So Amanda, a couple, just a couple of, in terms of self-neglect and hoarding, the okay. main two or three issues you'd be assessing and looking for. Right, so um, thankfully and quite helpfully we have a risk assessment um, guidance tool um, within the policy that we can use to identify the, the main areas of self-neglect that we would be concerned about and that also help us to appraise the level of risk. Um, and so that would be, for example, fire risk, I think, is at the forefront because in terms of the, the possible harm that can be caused by a fire, um, I think it's important for all practitioners to understand what constitutes a fire risk. Um, so, for example, people who may have emollients stockpiled or, uh, or continence products or um, sometimes properties that are 
hoarded or neglected might end up with, um, you know, maybe wires that are unkempt and that, and that sort of thing. So fire risk, I think, is the main thing that we think of um, in terms of trying to minimise that risk in a, in a timely manner. Um, and then we also consider health. People's health is obviously really important to their overall well-being. So um, physical health can be significantly affected when somebody is self-neglecting and boarding. So um, sometimes we find people with ulcerated legs where they may not be um, managing their personal care enough. Um, we've had a whole spectrum. So the thing to remember with self-neglect is that we are worried about the extreme sort of um, risk. So when the risk is significant, that's when it then becomes a safeguarding issue. Um, we've had people with maggots, for example, where they've had um, pressure areas that have become infested. Um, and so, so health, I think, um, is one of the top three that we need to be concerned about. Um, and another thing also to think about is that um, hoarding itself is a um, is now a recognised mental health disorder. So as of 2013, um, the Diagnostic um, Statistical Manual included self um, sorry hoarding in, in America as a as a an abuse not an abuse category as a as a mental health condition in its own right. Um, and as of 2018, um, the ICD-11, the International Classification of Diseases, also included hoarding. So to me, that means we need to be really considering people's mental health and particularly identifying that for many people who hoard in particular, there is a, a complex interplay of physical issues, mental health. Um, and when I say mental health, covering things like depression, anxiety, um, Diogenes syndrome and um, also um, concerns such as... Diogenes um, being the Greek philosopher who lived in a barrel. Absolutely. So, <laughs> that sort of thing. So, yeah, so I, I think um, those are the main things we need to consider. But the, the, there's a whole spectrum, really, and each person's situation will, um, will, will dictate what level of risk there is. Thanks, Amanda. And I'd like to pay tribute to Amanda's work on this. It's on our website. It's quite groundbreaking. Um, thank you for that. Um, Simon, uh, just in terms of what you're looking for and when a, a situation might approach the threshold for a criminal prosecution, what are you in particular looking for? Yeah, sometimes, I mean, in, in, there are two forms really. A lot, as I said before, some of our cases or the majority of our cases will come via the mass process. So there's a referral that's gone in, somebody, either a teacher, a health visitor, um, or a child has made a disclosure, and um, it may come from another professional party, and it's um, agreed as a joint visit. So in those kind of cases, we will generally have some research done before we enter the house. So we'll have a little bit of background information that might tell us a bit about the family, a sibling, a previous incident, some of the indicators around drug abuse, alcohol abuse, domestic abuse. Um, so those ones are more straightforward because we're perhaps going in with um, more knowledge about the family, which may have already started to shape some of our decision making. As we walk in, obviously, similar to as, as, as Jenny had said, we'll look for some of the indicators. Um, general living conditions, I think, is a big one for me. Um, again, being child centred on, on, on our approach. Uh, and I try and say to people and educate people to say that we should be intervening at the lowest appropriate level. Um, removing a child is a, is a massive thing uh, and shouldn't be done lightly. Obviously, we do have the police powers and we do use them. Um, sadly, we, sometimes, you know, we have to use them more than we would like to, um, but that's indicative of the circumstances under which we're faced. Um, on, on other occasions, we may have our response colleagues, our uniform colleagues, may be attending an incident um, for an unrelated matter. It may be a neighbourhood dispute, a harassment, a very low level crime. But what they're then faced with starts to set some alarm bells ringing. Um, and again, the indicators, as Jenny has mentioned, as I've alluded to, another one for me is, is around um, the level of communication of a child. So to put a little bit of context on that, I was made aware of a, of a recent job a few days ago um, where uh, one of our drugs teams went in to a house, um, executed a warrant and came across uh, a four-year-old child and the four-year-old child's ability to communicate didn't really resonate at the right level to the sergeant who went in and he had some concerns about 
this child's inability to actually articulate. And interestingly, exactly as, again, as Jenny had said, um, this child had never met this sergeant, but he's immediately very clingy, wants to, to hold on to him, uh, wants very interested in what he's doing, what he's writing, um, and was showing, in effect, a little bit of third party affection. And fortunately, the, the sergeant kind of started to scratch the surface, have a little bit more of a look, do some other checks, had a look around the house. And I think we've all heard the term professional curiosity. And I think perhaps we've moved on a little bit more from that, I hope, but I still think it's very relevant. Um, had a check around the house, looked at the living conditions, and ultimately then made a decision with social care and the emergency duty social worker to remove the child from the house. Um, and an interim okay. care order is now being applied for. So I think that's a kind of, put some context on it, how it's really important that sometimes we go in pre-armed with, with some information, but other times we need to be aware that it's a bit more dynamic and we should be reacting to what we're seeing. And we try and instill that in our officers um, from a response mm. perspective as they do go in. Yeah, that's hugely important to get first line responders aware of this, especially if someone's in love with a drug or drugs, not their Absolutely. children. And that's the priority. It, um, it, in Suffolk, of course, go on, Simon. Sorry, sorry. Um, it kind of resonates a bit with me as well about the professionals that go into houses. And it always makes me kind of smile that, that some families, um, other tradespeople are often in people's ha houses, electricians or plumbers, or there's other BT comms or whoever may be in there. But it's whether or not those professionals um, make those referrals. Because sometimes, obviously, many houses and, and many um, areas are not really referred to us, whereas there's many other uh, bodies, professionals, mm. tradespeople that go in. And, and all of us are trying to reach out to yes, everybody from taxi drivers to delivery drivers to do that. I'm going to ask um, each of you to just say something about um, successful interventions in your experience, because the goal is not just to accept, to assess, but to improve the situation. So I'm going to ask two more questions in the time we have. The first is about successful interventions, and the second is going to be about dealing with non-cooperative people or where there's a disengagement or a hostility, um, which can be about a failure on our part to reach people, but also can go with the territory of withdrawing and not allowing um, any contact. But, um, and this really does cross ages, cultures, classes, and um, neglect can be in affluent families, not just in poor families and so on. So let's turn to successful interventions. I'm going to start with Jenny, just to give one or two examples from your own experience. Okay, well, successful intervention relies on um, joint working and it relies on partnership with the families as well because um, sometimes a successful intervention can be really sadly that the child has to be removed from the family but I'm not that's that's another um, situation but really to get families on board with um, what we're seeing and understanding actually how their their living standards and what they're doing um, is impacting on their child can take a lot of highly skilled work with them and it's a lot of quite often a long ongoing process because actually um, what we found with families with neglect quite often it's intergenerational families have lived and um, they can't see necessarily that how they're living is um, there's anything wrong with because actually quite often it's better than the way they were brought up so it's about using tools such as the graded care profile which is a therapeutic um, tool in itself which um, goes through every single aspect um, of a child's life and alongside the family we're able to assess and take the um, take the subjectivity out of neglect so that it's an objective tool where it's not our lived experience of what we would want for our children or not necessarily the families but it's actually using that tool to say okay this is best case scenario this is worst case scenario where are we sitting on on that continuum so um, using uh, tools but it's, it's, it's also about the therapeutic relationship actually families need to feel that they can trust the professionals we need to be really honest about what we're seeing and what our worries are there's no point going into a family saying everything's fine and then going back and putting a referral into social services that does not work for families we need to be really honest saying okay 
we're seeing some really good stuff here using some strength based approaches really good stuff here but equally we're really worried about might be really worried about this aspect and we want to be there to support you and it's about um working with the family so that they understand the impact of what they're seeing or what they're what they're doing on their child's yeah. immediate um and also long term so just naming it sometimes actually do you think there's a risk of professionals becoming desensitized and tolerating the unacceptable i think i think that that's where supervision is really important mm. because yes i do believe that over if you work in the same area where neglect is i mean in the north of the county we have real issues with neglect and, fam and professionals walk into families day in day out and see some really quite horrific living conditions but that's where the importance of really robust safeguarding supervision and also peer supervision in, and that's where homeworking can sometimes be a bit tricky because that you know informal conversations in the office when you come back and go oh crikey I've just walked into that and and then p other people can sort of you can bounce off other people as well so yeah it's a really it's a tricky one but I would say the key actually also strength based I think it's really important to work with family strengths yeah. as well because it's very Motiv rare. motivational work yeah, yeah very Amanda. rare sorry yeah Amanda, successful intervention. Okay, so from the point of view of self-neglect and hoarding, I think the primary thing, if people can take one thing away, would be to realise that um, self-neglect and hoarding is not a lifestyle choice. So there is a flawed belief by some professionals that, well, that's how they've always lived and that's how they choose to live. Um, really, when people are self-neglecting and hoarding, there is often, I have touched on the root causes, for example, and that's the primary thing that you need to be considering when working with people who self-neglect and hoard. So there will be a causal link for most people. It's about identifying what is it that has led to this situation, expressing that professional um, concerned curiosity with the person as to what what might have led to that and also potentially speaking to people within the family speaking to um, other professionals who know the person neighbors even obviously being very careful about that confidentiality but um, weighing it up against the potential benefit and heart um, and risk because um, I think it's very important to understand why the person might be self neglecting and hoarding, and that creates a narrative which really holds the key to intervening. So, really, to see that um, long term change, you need to be un uh, understanding what has led to that. Um, and another thing that we often hear about is, um, particularly with hoarding, th there will be almost, an, for some people, an immediate um, wish to declutter or to um, maybe clear everything and that can be really traumatic to people so what we advocate um, is for, for that long-term intervention that is based on trust that is based on relationship building that it does take time um, obviously don't lose sight of the more immediate risks such as fire risk or anything else that might cause immediate harm to the person but really work on building trust with the person if you if you remove for example with hoarding maybe you might remove one can of coke one day that's a massive um thing for, for a person so really celebrate those little changes um but the main thing is that those draconian harm reduction methods such as enforcement um it's important to understand that research shows there is an almost total regression rate with those things so there will be situations where that does need to happen maybe the risk is untenable and it does need to happen but as a last resort and um, the, the main thing also is to realise that um, the trauma might actually just bring them back to where they were before and maybe even worsen the situation. So um, the trauma informed um, methods such as working with somebody slowly and also um, the recognised way of working with people who, with a hoarding disorder, for example, is cognitive behavioural ther therapy. I know that's not particularly possible at the moment. It's not really um, something that we have in Suffolk at the moment for the vast majority of our um, people with hoarding disorder, but that is the identified golden standard, which um, looks at working with somebody over time to understand um, how those root causes can be worked on. If it's a bereavement, working with somebody around that, it's really about identifying the cause and working with, with people. And also going back to what um, Jennifer said about those strengths-based approaches, um, also being able to um, speak to people about those you know what we call the danger statements in signs of safety in Suffolk so saying to somebody that we're really concerned about this and if nothing changes 
that will happen. And the other main thing to, to think of is also um, working with significant others that might be within the home. So one of our um, recommendations from the recent Safeguarding Adult Review was to really consider the potential impact of people living with the person. Is it the other person potentially who might be um, amassing things within the property or collecting? Or is it the other person that might be declining intervention on behalf of the person at risk? So really understand the whole family. Um, if there are children involved, make sure that you know, a, a, an appropriate referral has been made for the children because it's about the whole family, it's about the whole, um, really the whole picture. Um, and speaking of strength, solution focused practice is the main thing, you know, maybe using the miracle question, if, you know, if a miracle happened overnight, what would things look like tomorrow morning? And just being creative, so creativity really, and um, understanding the, per the person and building those relationships, but not losing sight of immediate risk. That's a terrific framework, thanks. And then maybe in a sentence or two, what would trigger a Mental Capacity Act assessment in the midst of all that? Right, so that's a really important question. So um, I think, well, Michael Preston Shute, who is one of the lead academics um, in self neglect and hoarding, has um, said that actually in most cases of intractable self neglect and hoarding, you should automatically be considering if just by virtue of the extent of the risk. Is there something else going on? So for example, um, so the basics obviously of capacity apply, the person needs to have a disturbance in the functioning of their mind for us to consider doing a capacity assessment. Um, so for example, a hoarding disorder in itself, if somebody's identified as having a hoarding disorder, which we need to um, realise it's a diagnosis, we can't just say they have it, they have to be diagnosed with it, then that in itself, we should be questioning um, the person's capacity. And um, we should also be understanding that when somebody has um, or lacks capacity, when, when somebody lacks the mental capacity to make a decision, then that should be happening in their best interest, but still um, trying to work with them in, in, a, in a structured way and in a gradual phased way. That's great. Thanks very much. Um, Simon, successful child-centred policing, how would you describe that in terms of making the biggest impact? Yeah, I think I think a lot of people will have a thought that, that a successful outcome for us will be a charge and someone gets locked up in prison. And and whilst that is an, there's an element of that, that's not our all, all our primary goals about making positive changes and positive outcomes either for the child or or, or for the adult. And um, picking up from Amanda, uh, we had a case, um, and I'm going back about uh, at least 18 months, possibly pushing sort of 20 months. Um, a referral came in for a, uh, an elderly um, gentleman who was on his own um, and it was a case of hoarding. A, a referral had come through from a neighbour showing some concerns. Um, our vulnerable adult officer attended with one of the local um, adult services team and started to engage and exactly as Amanda says it wasn't one of these quick hits where initially perhaps we think there's there's some uh, he was hoarding newspapers and magazines and other things and in actual fact Part of you wants to just declutter and get, and get it out of the house to allow him to move more safely and, it, and it's not about that um, and our intervention with him um, took uh, I think it was around 15 months um, with other professional partners other agencies other help and, and it uh, it was covering up some other issues around self-neglect um, hygiene personal hygiene and the inability to to really look after himself and and I think the success from that came around 15 18 months later where he was able to live far more independently than ever he was before um, in a much much safer environment and, and that took a long time to achieve that with lots of different partners but that is a real positive outcome that, that won't be shown anywhere or recorded anywhere in, in a traditional police method um, in relation to children very similar um, we've got many cases on the go, um, certainly here in the East, and, and as Jenny alluded to, we, we do have sadly quite a high number of children who were either on child protection plans or, or, or child in need. Um, and we've got a, one particular case at the moment, it involves some, some element of sexual abuse, and I won't go into the details of that, but there was an, the significant neglect issues there. We use our police powers. We've removed the children. We're working closely with social care around um, and they're, they're currently in the foster placement. And to see those children now thriving, um, being given the love, the emotional support, 
the kind of things that we would all give our children. Um, even uh, they came across to us to give their video interviews uh, and they'd never had proper sweets or chocolate. And, and I've got some of my staff going across the road to buy them sweets and chocolates and things and, and, and to see their reaction to those and, and to go and revisit two months later um, with a foster care and see them clean clothed, they're playing on scooters, playing in the back garden. You know, there's, there's, you can't put a price on that from a, from a traditional performance uh, related um, point. It, it's difficult to see and, and to see staff still becoming emotional uh, around the positive interventions they're having in cases of child neglect. Uh, is really quite touching and and you know you mentioned earlier about is there an immunity to some of the professionals there's a danger i think sometimes of that but i think in some some cases it's really reassuring when we see how our staff and, and how we will react to those those kind of things when we know that the child or the adult's best interest is at heart so there's a couple of examples of positive uh success stories for me they're terrific examples thanks simon and yes i think that's one of the measures of significant harm if a child recovers in alternative care within a few days and starts to blossom. Um, if the harm hasn't been significant, the outcomes of a transfer res residence won't be as, as positive. Um, one of the findings of our case review learning audit was that neglect is the single biggest issue facing the partnership and in terms of child protection plans neglect and emotional harm are the biggest two. That's why we're running this webinar. And we're going to close because we're, our time is running out by just a, um, a quick look at non-cooperation and disengagement. Now, I suspect the answer might be to stick with it and make a relationship. Um, but I'm going to give Jenny, Simon and Amanda just uh, an opportunity to say something about how you work with disengagement and non-cooperation personally, um, and then we'll draw to a close. So we can start with Jenny, then Simon, and the last word from Amanda. Jenny. So that's a really difficult thing when the family starts to disengage um, or don't engage right in the beginning. So um, from our point of view in health, one of the key things is about multi-agency working. So if we're struggling to engage with a, with a family, it's really important, important that we contact the other agencies who might be involved with them. So contact school, speak to school, contact mental health workers or um, GPs. Whoever might well be already involved with the family to see if there's a way to engage with that family in a different way. So sometimes it could be actually, oh, they never answer the phone, you've got text or um, just different ways of engaging. Um, if the family is still ready to engage with us and we have significant concerns around neglect, then we put everything in place to try and support the family, but they've actually rejected all the support that has been offered. Then obviously we need to escalate it. Um, into a safeguarding arena and we would be having conversations um, with social care and the other agencies around that. Um, that's really last resort because the most important thing is trying to work alongside families and get them on board and working with us so that they um, so that they so that they don't, we don't have to move into that arena. However, unfortunately sometimes that is the case because sometimes um, the non-engagement is around significant drug and alcohol abuse issues or significant domestic violence or mental health which is causing the non-engagement which again is escalating the risks to the child so it's on a case-by-case -case scenario um, and um, every single case we need to do a really thorough investigation around the risks to the child and the risks if we don't get the family to engage and then whether we need to escalate it into a safeguarding arena or um, or whether we need another agency who are able to engage and work alongside them. So sometimes it's working alongside schools, for example, because actually the family will engage with the school and um, we, yeah, we work with them. So it's a non-engagement is a really difficult mm. one and I think we all struggle with that at times. Thanks, Jenny. Anything to add to that, Simon? Uh, no, really following on from that, yeah, it, it, I'll go back to my original point of, of always trying to intervene at the lowest appropriate level. And when I say appropriate, that's that's the movement there. That's the area where we can we can kind of react to. Um, <clears throat> we're in a quite a fortunate position with the police, really. We we do have the power of the law to, to back us up and to remove, particularly in the case of children. Um, the, the threshold is, is significant harm. 
Um, and that may be exacerbated by the lack of cooperation or the lack of willingness from the parent or guardian or the carer to make those those changes to, to the child's life that would decrease that significant harm. And, it, and if that isn't met or isn't shown to us, then again, we'll work really closely and dynamically with social care um, at those scenes um, to make those decisions, those tough decisions about are we going to remove those children here and now. Um, so yes, th there is that engagement that's needed with the parents to try and nurture and educate them to make those changes themselves but when faced ultimately with the issue of is this child likely to suffer significant harm if we all uh, go back to our cars and drive away if the answer to that is yes then absolutely dynamically we will make that decision there and we will take those children um, away so we, we are in a little bit more of a fortunate circumstance when we have the power of the law behind us. Thanks Simon and last word from Amanda. Um, so I have touched already on the um, importance, of, importance of relationship building. So what I would add to that is um, also the importance of being legally literate in what um, options there are when, when there is um, that intractable risk and the person is um, declining the intervention required to reduce it. So um, we know from the nature of self and collective hoarding that that tends to be quite impulsive. So it's important for professionals not to have an un un unquestioning acceptance of the person's assurances that yes, they might do what it is that's required to reduce the risk themselves. If they're declining intervention, I think we need to continue to try and build a relationship anyway. So if they do potentially um, lack capacity, it's not just the decisional capacity that should be considered, it's also the executive capacity. So it, the person might say, yes, I, I will do this, and I understand if I don't, this will happen. It might appear that, yes, they, they definitely do understand it, but it's important to also question whether or not they can execute those tasks. There is a guide in the policy, in the bigger policy, which um, supports practitioners to, to assess executive capacity. Um, and of course, th there are um, professionals who can help with that as well within, within the um, partnership. Um, and the other thing is also to consider that um, if the risk has gone on for, for a while, we definitely need to be having those meetings, those case conferences, um, if there are blockers in the way, in the way that we're working. So it's not just the engagement of the person, it's are we doing what we need to be doing to support them? Are we trying to build that relationship? And if we have concerns about how we're working together, then we need to be escalating that to the, um, to the high risk panel. Um, so also being creative. So we recently had a case in, um, in my team where we had to think of all sorts of creative ways of minimizing the risk because the carers couldn't have gone in to, to support the people given the risk to them. Um, so we worked with a care agency that was excellent in reducing that risk. So it's about relationship building with the person, but also between us as professionals to maximize that network that that we have around us to support the person. And in the worst kind of risks, we might we need to involve the legal team as well. We have a duty of care regardless of the person's disengagement. So we need to continue to try. Um, and if it carries on, either we go to the court of protection if the person lacks capacity. Um, and in the worst cases, we haven't had one of these in, in Suffolk, maybe the High Court um, for their inherent jurisdiction. So we just need to keep trying. And the policy says, which I, I included within the policy myself, that no agency is to um, close the case prior to professional agreement if there is that intractable risk with self data holding. So it has to be agreed by a multi-agency team first. That's a good point on which to end. So in, in conclusion of this section of the webinar, my thanks to Amanda, Simon and Jennifer for contributing your experience and practice knowledge. Pleasure. Thank you, Anthony.